Good morning. Today is Christmas Day, and this is a service of anti-communion. Our minor propers will be from Psalm 89. My song shall be always of the loving kindness of the Lord. With my mouth will I ever be showing thy truth from one generation to another. For I have said mercy shall be set up forever. Thy truth shalt thou establish in the heavens. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. My song shall be alway of the loving kindness of the Lord. With my mouth will I ever be showing thy truth from one generation to another. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O almighty Lord and everlasting God, vouchsafe we beseech thee, to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that, through thy most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. O God, who makest us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of thine only Son, Jesus Christ, grant that as we joyfully receive him for our Redeemer, so we may with sure confidence behold him when he shall come to be our judge, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Here beginneth the 10th verse of the second chapter of the book of the prophet Zechariah. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in his holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Here endeth the lesson. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever, and set up thy throne from one generation to another. The epistle is written in the second chapter of the epistle of St. Paul to St. Titus, beginning at the 11th verse. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of all good works. 
These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man dispute thee. Here endeth the epistle. Alleluia. Alleluia. O Lord, the very heaven shall praise thy wondrous works and my truth in the congregation of the saints. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is written in the second chapter of St. Luke, beginning at the first verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. For who is he among the clouds that shall be compared unto the Lord? Alleluia. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us. Under Pontius Pilate he suffered and was buried And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory, to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. 
So Christmas is absolutely my favorite time of year. I love the uh, resolution to our Advent preparations and expectations. I love the music and the carols. I love the traditional foods. I love seeing all the lights. I love my children's excitement as they look forward to a visit from jolly old Saint Nick. But most of all, I love coming to church at this chapel here at All Saints Anglican Church on Christmas Eve to worship with everybody assembled. Now, I grew up with many of these traditions. However, I spent my teens and 20s in a different tradition that didn't celebrate Christmas, but it was attending a Lessons and Carols service followed by taking communion one Christmas Eve here at All Saints many years ago that brought me back to my roots. You see, my own vocation to the priesthood is intimately tied up to Christmas and Christmas Eve here at All Saints Anglican Church at this very parish. So no matter how familiar the nativity celebrations may be, they will never lose their wonder for me. Our gospel reading this evening is also as wonderful as it is familiar. It's the well-known nativity narrative from the gospel according to St. Luke. Now, you may have noticed that this rendering doesn't have the wise men or King Herod. That's in St. Matthew's version, and we're going to be reading portions from that version over the next couple weeks um, in our lectionary. But for most folks, St. Luke's account is the one that we all know. That's the one, after all, that Linus quotes in the old Charlie Brown Christmas special. That's the one that we all expect to read Christmas morning. In fact, traditionally, that's the early morning reading of the gospel on Christmas morning in the Western Church. Well, because this is such a familiar story, it can be easy to miss some of the greater context, and therefore it can be easy to miss the significance of some of the important details. You see, the birth of Christ doesn't happen in a vacuum. No, it's part of the greater story of God's people. It's part of the greater story of Israel that we see beginning all the way back in Genesis. So before we can even get to St. Luke's, and it came to pass in those days, we need to set the stage. And indeed, St. Luke does this very thing one chapter later when he traces uh, our Lord's genealogy back to Adam. So back in the beginning of Genesis, we read that God created Adam and Eve, our first parents. Though God gave them but one commandment, our first parents as the Nativity homily from the second book of homilies says, quote, did notwithstanding most unmindfully, or rather most willfully, break it. With that sin then came the exile of all humanity, not only from paradise, not only from the Garden of Eden, but also from full fellowship with God. But God gave Eve a promise that one of her descendants would crush the head of the serpent, and rescue us from exile. Later on in Genesis, God calls Abraham and his family to be the ones through whom that Redeemer would come. He promises them the Holy Land as their inheritance and says that through them all nations and all peoples would be blessed. Several generations later, Abraham's family, God's people, become slaves in Egypt. God raises up Moses to lead them out of slavery and into the promised land. But the Lord warns them that if they refuse to listen to him, if they yoke themselves to false gods, they would once again become slaves. But God also promises that he would send a second prophet, a second Moses, who would lead them into the fullness of truth. Later on, God establishes a dynasty through the family of King David and promises that one of David's descendants would be the eternal king. He would be the Messiah, the anointed one, through whom that promised redemption would come to pass. But David's descendants, the kings that came after him, they led the people into idolatry and into sin, and they were indeed exiled from their land. Once again, they became slaves to foreign kings and foreign gods. Just as we had lost Eden, we now lost the promised land. Now, God's people certainly did eventually return to the promised land, but they were never again in the Bible independent. 
They never again had a prophet like Moses or a king like David. And indeed, Caesar Augustus' decree to tax the people that we read from the beginning of St. Luke's Nativity account, that's just another reminder to God's people that they were once again slaves. The opening of our gospel passage records a slap in the face then to Israel, reinforcing the seeming failed dynasty the seeming unfulfilled promises. But God was on the move. Just as God had glorified himself through Pharaoh in Moses' time, he would glorify himself through Caesar. He would use Caesar's insulting taxation to send David's descendants, Mary and Joseph, back to David's hometown of Bethlehem for the birth of the Messiah, just as he had promised through the Old Testament prophet Micah. A seeming accident of history was actually prophecy predicted of old. And we all know what happens next, right? Mary and Joseph are unable to find vacancy at the inn, and they have to give birth in the barn. Well, in fact, that's probably not quite how it takes place. (laughs) Um, The word translated in the King James here as inn is the same word that's used for the upper room that Jesus and his disciples borrowed at the Last Supper. So rather than a a full inn with a barn, probably what we have going on is rather a guest room that's filled up with other relatives, and which leaves only the bottom floor of the house uh, for Mary and Joseph. And that bottom floor would have functioned as a living room during the day, but at night you would have brought in the animals. It would have functioned as the stable at night. And really, I mean, if we think about it, it's very, very unlikely in that time and place and in that culture, that Joseph's kinfolk would turn out a family member and his pregnant wife. They just would not do that. But regardless of how we paint this picture, we do here have a scene of humility. King David's heir isn't born in a palace. He's born in an ordinary home among ordinary folk. But that doesn't mean that the coming of the Messiah is without fanfare. A full angelic choir appears to a group of shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, the shepherds are likely also very humble men, but their role fits within the greater pattern that we see in the Old Testament. The great patriarchs of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were all shepherds. Moses, the rescuer, the lawgiver, the quintessential prophet, He was a shepherd. David, the archetypical king, he was also a shepherd. And God often uses the shepherd imagery to describe his relationship to his people, as well as the relationship of the Israelite leadership to the rest of the congregation. And in fact, these Christmas-tied shepherds, these shepherds from the Christmas story, they were probably raising paschal lambs that were destined to be used in the Passover sacrifice when the great exodus was sacramentally commemorated. How fitting it is then that Paschal shepherds would be among the first to pay homage to the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. How fitting it is that these shepherds would come to worship the Good Shepherd. The first Gloria and Excelsis is still ringing in their ears at this point. Now, in our Old Testament lesson uh, for this morning, we have one of the great messianic prophecies from the prophet Zechariah. He said, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee, and the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. In the swaddled baby, born, as our Christmas tide colic says, of a pure virgin, in this baby the Lord has come to dwell in the midst of his people. The royal line had not failed. The promises were not forgotten. God himself came down to make good on his word. As our alternative gospel reading says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us, has come. 
And through the word incarnate, through God taking on our flesh, he also drew the nations to himself. As God had promised Abraham, all nations would be blessed because of Abraham's seed. The family has been expanded to all who would be joined to the Christ child. As we read in our epistle, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. But that grace has implications for our lives as followers of Christ. So hear the epistle. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works." These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The last part of our epistle tells us how that salvation has come to all men. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave himself as a sacrifice for us, dying for our sins so that we would be rescued from slavery to sin. We would be emancipated from bondage to the world, the flesh, and the devil. He has made us his special people, who is, and he has set us apart for good works. When the Blessed Virgin Mary said yes to the Lord, she took up both the glory of being the Lord's mother as well as the shame in the eyes of the world for being an unwed mother in a very traditional society. She humbled herself before the Lord, and the Lord raised her up. When the Blessed Virgin Mary said yes, the Holy Spirit came upon her, and she conceived the Messiah. When we are baptized into the Messiah, joined to him by faith, the Holy Ghost now indwells us. We are changed from the inside out. We are then both enabled and, to, and called to deny the world, the flesh, and the devil, and live lives of self-control, godliness, and righteousness. Not only do we do this looking back on our Lord's incarnation, but we also do so remembering that he will come again. Now in our colic this morning, we prayed this. We prayed, O God, who makest us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of thine only Son, Jesus Christ, grant that as we joyfully receive him for our Redeemer, so we may with sure confidence behold him when he shall come to be our judge, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. So Christmas, it is indeed a time of joy. Our Redeemer has come. May we then receive him with joy now, so that we may be received by him when he returns. I say this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We continue with the bidding prayer. Let us pray. Good Christian people, I bid your prayers for Christ's holy Catholic Church the blessed company of all faithful people, that it may please God to confirm and strengthen it in purity of faith, in holiness of life, and in perfectness of love, and to restore to it the witness of visible unity, and more especially for that branch of the same planted by God in this land, whereof we are members, that in all things it may work according to God's will, serve him faithfully, and worship him acceptably. You shall pray for the President of these United States and for the Governor of this state and for all that are in authority, that all and every one of them may serve truly in their special, several callings to the glory of God and the edifying and well-governing of the people, remembering the account they shall be called upon to give at the last great day. You shall also pray for the ministers of God's holy word and sacraments, for bishops, and herein more especially for Felix, the bishop of this diocese, for Scott, our bishop suffragan, and for fully our Archbishop and Primate, that they may minister faithfully and wisely the discipline of Christ. Likewise for all priests and deacons, and herein more especially for John, Marcus, and Eric, the clergy here residing, and Isaac, that they may shine as lights in the world, and in all things may adorn the doctrines of God our Savior. And you shall pray for a due supply of persons fitted to serve God in the ministry and in the state, and to that end, as well for all the good education of all youth of this land, you shall pray for all schools, colleges, and seminaries of sound and godly learning, and for all whose hands are open for their maintenance, 
that whatsoever tends to the advancement of true religion and useful learning may forever flourish and abound. You shall pray for all the people of these United States, that they may live in the true faith and fear of God and in brotherly charity one towards another. You shall pray also for all who travel by land, sea, or air, for all prisoners and captives, for all who are in sickness or in sorrow, for all who have fallen into grievous sin, for all who, through temptations, ignorance, helplessness, grief, trouble, dread, or the near approach of death, especially need our prayers. You shall also praise God for rain and sunshine, for the fruits of the earth, for the products of all honest industry, for all his good gifts, temporal and spiritual, to us and to all men. Finally, you shall yield unto God most high praise and hearty thanks for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all his saints, who have been the choice vessels of his grace and the lights of the world in their several generations. And pray unto God that we may have grace to direct our lives after their good examples, and that, this life ended, we may be made partakers with them of the glorious resurrection and the life everlasting. And now, brethren, summing up all our petitions and all our thanksgivings, and the words which Christ hath taught us, we make bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, who saidst unto thine apostles, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Regard not now our sins, but the faith of thy church, and grant to it that peace and unity which is according to thy will, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. We will conclude with the Gloria in excelsis and the blessing. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.